Hello and welcome to Getting Started with Rails 5 course on Eduonix Lesson 3. My name is Ilya and in this section I will quickly guide you through the final version of an application that we are going to develop throughout this course. So the final version of this application can be found at rails 5 adonixhirokoappcom And this application basically keeps track of different events like, uh, for example, meetings or conferences or maybe exhibitions that uh, the users can enroll for. So here I can sign in like uh, some existing user uh, that is an admin. And after I do that, I basically see a list of categories. Well, currently there is only one category. I can add some more. Another category. Here we go. So uh, as long as, an, as I am admin, I can edit these categories. I can remove these categories like this. And so if I open some existing category, I see uh, that here are the events of this category. Here it says that I'm already enrolled for this event here. As long as I am admin and actually I am an owner or organizer of this event, I can also edit it easily. I can change so when this event starts, when this event ends, what is the price to enter this event, and so on. So things like that. So here it says uh, that I am already enrolled for this event. Here is my avatar. Here it says that I have enrolled two hours ago and I can disenroll from this event. Uh, when a, a new event is created, all admins receive an email similar to this one. And also when someone enrolls for an event, the organizer also sees an, uh, a notification email. Okay, also <clears throat> here I can uh, basically change the language of our website. We are going to add support for two languages. So here, as you see, everything is localized now. So everything is in Russian. So I can easily go back and forth uh, between these languages. I can sign out, I can, of course, register as uh, some new as some new user, and if I, for example, provide some incorrect data, it says uh, that uh, those errors were found. So, for example, the email cannot be blank, the email, email is invalid, password can be blank, and if I register as uh, an ordinary user, I can't, uh, for example, add, uh, edit this event here because I'm not an organizer. I cannot edit this category as well because I'm not an admin. So things like that. Uh, so well, uh, that's how our application is going to look like. And uh, throughout this course, we are going to uh, slowly um, code uh, different parts of this application and also in uh, some lessons we are going to write uh, tests, automated tests for this application using RSpec. So we are going to test our models and we are going to write some feature tests. So as you see uh, this course is going to be pretty, uh, pretty long and it is going to present different concepts to you. So well, hold on tight and let's proceed to the next section and actually start our Rails journey. Hello and welcome back to getting started with Rails 5 course on Adonix. This is lesson 3. My name is Ilya and in this section we will create our Rails application and observe its main parts. To get started, you can open your terminal, navigate to the folder where you wish to store your project using cd command and then run. Rails new, then Brave Coder, which is going to be an, uh, a name of our application, and then T flag. So Rails new is going to create a brand new application for us with the provided name, uh, but do not use reserved words as the application's name, like class, module and others, that we are going to meet throughout this course. Uh, 
The T flag means that we do not want to use the default testing framework that Rails suggests. Later we will set a testing environment ourselves. You are going to see the output similar to what I have here. And now let me open this newly created application and quickly guide you through it. So the app folder is the main part of the application, it's hard. Uh, there are a bunch of folders inside, and the most important ones are assets, which contain style sheets, JavaScripts, images, and other things like fonts. Next, controllers, uh, that is going to host our controllers. Uh, currently, uh, there is only the application controller, but we'll create some more of them soon. The mailers directory contains code that is responsible for sending email. We will learn about mailers in uh, this course as well. Next, uh, there is the modal folder. Uh, currently, uh, there is only the application record file that defines an abstract class called application record. If you have used Rails 3 or 4 uh, before, you might be surprised to find this file here. Rails maintainers decided to bring more flexibility, and now all modules are inherited from application record by default, instead of the active record class itself. If you don't know what active record is, then don't worry, because we will discuss modules in one of the next lessons. Another important folder is views, that contains layouts and views from our app. In this lesson, we will create a couple of views ourselves. Config stores a configuration for our application. Uh, when the application is booted, uh, these files are being loaded in the first head. Uh, note the routes rb file, which lists all the routes. We are going to tweak it soon. Uh, DB folder contains all the files related to the application's database. Specifically, our development SQLite 3 database will be stored here. Public directory contains static files that will be served directly without interacting with the Rails server. As you see, uh, there are HTML pages for 404, 422 and 500 errors that you can tweak as needed. gitignore lists the files and folders that should not be included in version control system. It already excludes some temporary files and SQLite 3 databases, because in production you will have a separate database powered by Postgres or MySQL, most likely. I am going also to add IDEA folder uh, here as well. Uh, if you are using RubyMine, I also recommend doing the same, uh, because uh, that's a hidden folder with some IDE config uh, that does not directly relate to your uh, Rails application. And also there is a gem file that we will discuss in the next section. Uh, lastly, as you can see, this application comes with a readme file. Uh, this MD extension means markdown. Markdown is a simple markup language to format plain text. You don't need to study to create Rails applications, but if you wish to learn more, then don't hesitate to browse its official page at daringfireball.net projects markdown. Inside a readme there is some generic info about what readmes usually contain. So, uh, there are all the parts of Rails 5 applications uh, that we are going to be working with. Uh, don't worry if it seems too many, because we will move step by step and you will eventually understand how all these components are tied together. In the next section we will discuss gem files, so see you there! Hello and welcome back to getting started with Rails 5 course on Adonix. This is lesson 3 and my name is Ilya. In the previous section we've skimmed uh, through our newly created application and now we are going to discuss in more details uh, the file called a gem file. So let me open it now. Uh, so, Ruby on Rails is a great framework, but it relies on other libraries or gems, as Ruby calls it, to speed up creation of web applications even more. 
There are gems that provide authentication mechanisms, file uploading functionality, parsing of formats like JSON, XML, and many others. So, gem file is the place where all dependent libraries and their versions are provided. You are free to tweak it as necessary by adding or removing gems. Uh, the first line here says source uh, rubygems.org. It specifies where the gems should be downloaded from. RubyGems.org is the standard platform that hosts thousands of gems, and you are free to choose any of them. Here is the Rails gem, the core of our application. Note that you may use the Edge version by providing GitHub like this, and still I do not recommend doing so, especially for real-world applications, because some new features introduced in the Edge version might break your application, and also new versions may change the behavior of existing components and introduce breaking changes, so therefore be very careful when migrating to a newer version of Rails, and always test your application before publishing it to production environment. SQLite 3 is the default relational database management system for Rails. The cool thing about it is that you don't need to install any additional software on your PC. As the name implies, it is very lightweight and the whole database is just one file. But still, uh, SQLite 3 is not suitable for production before pushing it our project. To a production server, we will utilize another adapter. Uh, Puma is used as the default application web server, so you don't need to install something like Apache or IIS on your development machine. Puma is fast and offers concurrency, so it's a really great server. In other versions of Rails, the brick was used as the default web server. And actually, if you remove Puma from the gem file, then the application will revert back to the brick. SAS Rails offers support for SAS preprocessor that we will discuss later. Uglifier is a tool to compress your JavaScript files before pushing it to production environment. Uh, Coffee Rails provides support for CoffeeScript preprocessor uh, that will be also discussed later. Next, uh, there is a jQuery Rails gem that allows to easily include jQuery on your pages. jQuery is an immensely popular JavaScript library, greatly simplifying many common tasks, from adding and removing elements to creating animations and performing Ajax requests. Still, you, if you don't want to use jQuery in your project, this gem can be safely removed. Turbolinks makes navigating between the pages much faster, and we will talk about them later as well. JBuilder is used to create JSON APIs, but we won't need it for this course, so let's remove it. Next, note this group word. It specifies under which environment the following gems should be loaded. There are three environments by default – development, production, and test. By default, a development environment is used. Actually, if you open config environments directory, you will notice that there are different config files for each environment. By default, Rails provides us with two gems that simplify development process, but I'm going to include a couple of others. Annotate is used to, well, to annotate your modules, controllers, specs, and some other files. It is a pretty handy tool that we are going to use later. Better Errors, as the name implies, displays errors in a more friendly format. Binding of color is, uh, is used in conjunction with it and allows to utilize console right on the errors page. I will show you how it looks in the next steps. So, after you change your gem file, you have to stop your Rails server, install the gems and boot the server again. Luckily, you don't need to perform installation manually. Instead, navigate to your Rails project folder and issue bundle install command. Bundler is a tool that automatically manages applications dependencies for you. Let me also say a couple of words about versions of your gems. As you see, some gems have their versions specified in various formats. 
It is done to ensure that your application uses consistent gem set with known versions and you do not end up in a situation when some gem was updated, breaking changes were introduced and your application effectively stops working. This, uh, there is a handful of ways uh, to specify a gems version. So, first of all, you may skip the version entirely, like I did for annotate, for example. Uh, so, it means use the latest stable version possible. It can be done for supportive gems or for gems that are highly unlikely to contain major breaking changes, like Puma, for example. Next, you can strictly specify which version you want to use. Uh, in this case, only the, the version of the gem will be used and it will never be updated until you change uh, this version manually. So, for example, you might uh, strictly specify Rails version, for example. And also, you may allow Bundler to perform minor updates to the gem. So, for example, uh, this construct here after SAS Rails means use any version equal to 5.x. So, the idea here is that most gems follow sem semantic versioning. Uh, the first number means major version of the library. And uh, if this number changes, uh, it means uh, that some big breaking changes were introduced to the library. If you note that one of your gems has a new major version, then be sure to check its docs and read what exactly was changed. In some cases, authors even provide migration guides. Uh, the second number is the minor version. If it changes, then some new functionality was added to the gem, but it is backwards compatible. Uh, the third number is the patch version. If it changes, then some relatively small bug fix was applied and it is backwards compatible. Another option is to say use any version of the gem higher or equal to the provided one. It is useful in scenarios when you know some older version of the library contains an error, and so you make sure that a newer version is used. And well, additionally, uh, you may say any version smaller to the provided one or greater than the provided one by using less than and greater than uh, operators. Also, uh, as I said, you may use uh, the latest version directly from GitHub. Uh, you may even choose which branch to use and the default branch is master. There is another thing uh, that I have to mention. You have probably noticed uh, that gemfile.log file it lists all the gems versions that are currently used in your application as well as gems that are listed as dependencies. So, for example, uh, the Better Errors gem has some dependencies and in most cases you don't have to worry about it uh, because an author of the library provides uh, the required dependencies and Bundler installs them for you. But you have to remember another thing. So, when running bundle install, you basically install all the gems with the versions specified inside the gem file log, with regards to what is specified inside the gem file. If for some reason gemfile.log is not present, then bundle install will generate it for you by using uh, as late versions of the gems as possible, but it will obey instructions inside the gem file. However, you might ask, what if some of my gems are locked to a specified version inside the gem file lock, and what if I want to upgrade it? Well, in this case, you can run bundle update and provide the gem's name. Alternatively, you can just use bundle update to update all the gems and rebuild the gem file lock. In this case, Bundler uh, lists which gems were updated and what the new version is. The less known comment is bundle outdated. It says which gems can be potentially updated, but still be very careful with this. So, for example, here it says RL, a, gems, a gem that is listed as a dependency. It is not currently present inside the gem file and we can update it.
I will go ahead and add it to the gem file, explicitly saying use version 8 or higher. Now run bundle update and look what happens. Bundler have detected a conflict. The thing is that Rails gem depends on active record gem that we will use when talking about models, and active record in turn requires Rail to be version 7, but not version 8, and therefore we've introduced a conflict, and so let's remove Rail from gem file. Uh, to see the, uh, which versions are currently used, you can also run bundle list command. So here is, for example, our RL version 7. You may also open rubygems.org website, search for active record and look at the dependencies section. And as you see, it states RL version 7, any minor version. So that's why we could not update it to version 8. So, okay, uh, this wraps uh, uh, this video on gems and gem file, and let's proceed to the next section and create a couple of static pages for our application. See you there! Hello and welcome to getting started with Rails 5 course on Adionix. This is lesson 3. My name is Ilya, and in this section we will create a couple of static and semi-static Rails pages. As you remember, the public directory contains static files. Currently it has pages for various errors, but what I can also do is create another file here and call it, for example, test.html. This is going to be a very simple HTML file. So now you can open your terminal and navigate to the project's directory and run a Rails server or simply Rails S command to boot your web server. By default, uh, Puma will use port uh, 3000, so inside your browser navigate to localhost, uh, then port 3000, uh, then slash test.html. And so uh, this is a truly static page uh, that is served very fast, and in production, uh, if you have Nginx set up, it can take advantage of Nginx caching. However, with static pages you cannot use any Ruby on Rails goodies. So therefore, let's create a so-called semi-static page powered by Rails. First of all, we will require a controller that is going to manage our page. As you remember, controllers acts like a glue between models and views. At this point we won't have any model, so the controller will simply decide which view to render. Uh, inside the controllers directory, let's create a pages controller file. Note the naming conventions. Pages is plural, and also it has the controllers postfix. Inside, define a new class that inherits from application controller. Application controller, in turn, inherits from action controller base, that provides many useful methods for us. Inside, let's define the index method. Uh, this will be the name for our sta semi-static page. I'm going to call it simply index. Now let's add some markup. Inside the views directory creates a pages folder. Once again, note uh, the plural form. Uh, by default, pages controller will try to search for the views inside the pages directory. It can be overridden though. Inside, let's add the index.html.erb file. Index is the name of the method that we've just defined. ERB extension means that this file has to be pre-processed before rendering it. ERB means embedded Ruby, so inside this file we can insert a Ruby code that will be interpreted by the preprocessor. Uh, so, most of this file is a good old HTML, but what are these symbols? So, uh, this is uh, the embedded Ruby code. Inside, I can place any instructions that will be carried out before rendering the page. And note uh, this equals sign. It means uh, that the code should be evaluated and the result has to be printed out on the page. If I remove the equal sign, then the code will still be evaluated, 
but nothing will be printed out. As long as I want to display the current time, I will leave this symbol here. And now you might wonder why haven't I included HTML, head and body tags on this page. But luckily for us, Rails already provides a so-called layout, a base page that contains all basic markup. Let's navigate to the Views Layouts directory and note this application.html.erb file inside. Our markup from the index.html.erb file uh, will be embedded inside this layout to the place where the yield method is placed. Of course, you may use a different layout or no layout at all, but for now we won't dig into such complexities. Uh, by the way, while I'm here, let's provide a char set for our pages by saying meta char set and then UTF-8. Great, so we've created our first controller and a view. However, how the user is supposed to open that new page? Because if I navigate to the root of my application, I will see a welcoming Rails page. Uh, well, uh, how about a local host and then slash index? Well, it says no such page, and this happens because we have not defined a route yet. A routes instruct the applications uh, that we want, what we want to do with the received request, what controller and what action to use. By default, our application has no routes at all, so let's open the routes RB from inside the config directory, and now let's say that our index page will be the root of the whole application. To do that, simply write a root to, and then pages, and then a pound, and then index. So pages is the name of our controller, and the controller's postfix is not needed here, and the index is the name of the method inside. This method, by default, will render a view called index uh, from the views pages folder. Uh, this principle is called convention over configuration and that's very cool, so we don't need any complex setup to create a very simple page. Now let's return to the root of your application and look at that. Now everything is working as expected. If you browse the pages markup, you won't see any Ruby code, of course, because the preprocessor has done its job and instead of that time.current code, I see the current time displayed, uh, well, this time is in UTC. Also, if you open the terminal, you are going to see uh, this uh, block of output saying that the request was processed successfully. Great, so our first page is now created and in the next lesson we will talk a bit more about views and we will also discuss other preprocessors and serving assets like fonts. So, see you there!